It's estimated that 250,000 people are reported missing each year in the UK alone. This is the equivalent of one person going missing every two minutes. With this in mind, we can only imagine how many people vanish each year in the world. Some of these people are found alive, and some are sadly found dead. What really puzzles me are the cases where the person seems to literally vanish without a trace, especially under strange or what seems to be impossible circumstances. So from the disappearance of the true father of cinematography, to a girl who vanished on the top floor of a 20-storey building, here is a list of five people who seem to completely vanish into thin air. Corrie McKeague Corrie McKeague is a senior Royal Air Force gunner from Fife, Scotland. He was based at RAF Honington in Suffolk, close to Barry St Edmunds. On Friday the 23rd of September 2016, Corrie went on a night out in Barry St Edmunds with five of his friends and colleagues. He had driven himself into town with the intention of leaving his car in the town overnight. The men went to a nightclub called Flex. At around 1am, Corrie was told to leave the club as security said he was too drunk to stay. Despite this, on later questioning, they said Corrie was not misbehaving and left the club on his own with no problems. He even stopped to talk with security outside the club after he left. Between 1.15 and 1.30am, he was seen ordering and eating food at his favourite takeaway. After this, Corrie is then seen falling asleep in the doorway of a nearby shop until 3.25am. He is then seen walking along the street and off of the CCTV camera into a horseshoe-shaped cul-de-sac and is never seen again. There is only one way in and out of this area, so what happened to Corrie? The cul-de-sac consisted of the back entrances and refuse areas of a row of shops. A bin lorry had emptied the industrial bins later that morning and police now speculate that Corrie had climbed into one of the bins to sleep and had been accidentally dumped in the nearby landfill site. This theory seemed to be backed up by Corrie's mobile phone data which matched the route of the lorry before losing its signal. There are still several things about this story that don't make sense. The problem is that no trace of Corrie or his mobile phone has ever been found in the bin lorry or at the landfill site, despite a 20 week search through 3,000 tonnes of rubbish in the area where his body would have been dumped. Corrie's parents do not believe that he would willingly get into a rubbish bin to sleep, so how did he end up in the bin and how did the lorry driver not realise someone was in the back of the lorry or dumped onto the landfill site? Why didn't Corrie wake up while this was happening? Also, why would he sleep in a bin when he could have slept in his car which was parked nearby? Corrie's family feel certain a third party was somehow involved. This leads me to think that something bad happened to him before he ended up in the bin. But if a third party was involved, why were they not seen entering or leaving the area on CCTV? And why is there no trace of blood or Corrie's body near the refuse area or in the landfill site? I hope that one day Corrie's family finally do get some answers on what happened to him that night. Louis Le Prince This is a pretty interesting case. Louis Le Prince is a name that we should all know, but I would guess that most of the people watching this have never heard of him. I didn't know who he was myself until I started the research for this video. Le Prince was a French inventor who was the true father of cinematography and shot the first moving pictures on paper using a single lens camera in 1888. His first film was called Round Hay Garden Scene. He then filmed traffic and pedestrians crossing Leeds Bridge in the UK. These scenes were then projected onto a screen in Leeds making it the first motion picture exhibition. This was several years before anyone else achieved this, despite most people crediting the Lumiere brothers or Thomas Edison as the father of cinematography. The following year, Le Prince took up dual American citizenship so he could promote his work and further his research. In September 1890, he planned a trip back to the UK to patent his camera and then planned to return to America for a public demonstration of his work. While in the UK, he decided to go and visit his family in France before returning to America. 
on September the 16th, he took a train from Dijon to Paris. He was seen boarding the train by his brother, although when it arrived in Paris, Le Prince and all his belongings were nowhere to be seen, and he was never seen again. This meant he never had a chance to promote his work in the United States, and his legacy seemed to disappear with him. No luggage or corpse was ever found on the Paris-Dijon Express, or on the rail tracks, and no one saw him on board the train. Nothing unusual was reported on the train itself either, so what happened to Le Prince is a complete mystery. Several theories have been proposed as to what happened to him, from suicide to murder by one of his rivals. Some people have questioned Thomas Edison's involvement, due to the fact that shortly after the disappearance, Edison tried to take credit for Le Prince's invention. This was disputed in a court case between Edison and Le Prince's widow and son, Adolphe Le Prince. Adolphe was denied using his father's camera as evidence that he was the true inventor, and Edison won the case, but this was later overturned. Despite this, many Americans still consider Edison as the father of cinematography. In another strange twist, two years after the case, Adolphe Le Prince was found dead whilst out shooting ducks on Fire Island near New York. Nicole Marin Nicole Marin was an eight-year-old Canadian girl who lived with her mother in a penthouse apartment in a building called the West Mall in Toronto, Canada. On the 30th of July 1985, at 10.30am, she had gone down to the apartment lobby to collect the mail and return safely home. She had arranged to go swimming in the indoor pool with one of her friends, who would stay waiting for her in the lobby. She spoke with her friend from her apartment on the intercom and said she would be straight down with her swimming gear. Nicole then left the apartment and was never seen or heard from again. Her friend waited for about 15 minutes before buzzing her apartment again to ask why she hadn't arrived yet. Her mother then raised the alarm that Nicole was missing and a search started. One resident thought they saw Nicole enter the elevator, but other than this, no one saw or heard anything unusual. It is thought that someone abducted Nicole in the hallway, but how did they do this from the top floor of a 20-storey building without being seen or heard by anyone? Her disappearance sparked the largest police investigation in Toronto's history. A task force of 20 police and 900 volunteers took part in an extensive search of the entire building, neighbourhood and all surrounding areas, using cars, horses, aircraft, dogs and all-terrain vehicles, but no trace of Nicole was ever found. It was as if she simply closed her apartment door and vanished without a trace. The search still continues to this day in the hopes that someday people will find out what really happened to Nicole Marin that day. Jimmy Hoffa Jimmy Hoffa was an American labor union leader who became president of one of the largest American unions known as the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Hoffa left school at the age of 14 and took full-time manual labour jobs to help support his family as his father died when Jimmy was only seven years old. It was working in these jobs that started his involvement in unions and advocating for workers' rights. While working for a grocery store chain, Hoffa began to organise a union to take action on the low wages and poor working conditions they were subjected to, and he eventually became leader of this union. This then led to him becoming an organiser for the local Teamsters of Detroit. Hoffa soon went up the ranks in the Teamsters and eventually became its very popular president. The problem was that the Teamsters had ties with organised crime, and many of the people involved with unions, especially the trucking unions, also had ties with mobsters and organised criminals. For Hoffa to expand and unite the unions, he made deals with these criminals. The influence of organised crime on the Teamsters would grow as the union itself expanded. In 1967, he was eventually convicted of jury tampering, attempted bribery and fraud, and was sentenced to 13 years in prison. 
In 1971, he was granted a pardon agreement from President Richard Nixon and was released from prison, but had to resign as president of the Teamsters and was banned from any union activity until 1980. Hoffa hoped to overturn this and tried to return as leader of the IBT, but was unsuccessful. On the 30th of July, 1975, Hoffa had told people he was meeting up with Anthony Giacoloni and Anthony Provenzano. Provenzano was a teamster leader in New Jersey and both men were mafia leaders. Hoffa went to a restaurant in Detroit to meet them at around 2pm. At 2.30pm he called his wife and said the men did not show up. He said he would wait a few more minutes then leave and he was never seen again. His car was found unlocked in the restaurant car park but no trace of Jimmy was found. One man claimed to have seen Hoffa in the back seat of a car with a large grey object next to him on the seat. Provenzano and Gio Coloni denied ever having arranged to meet him and they were found not to have been near the restaurant that day. So who drove away with Jimmy in the back seat? There have been various claims as to who was involved with his disappearance and why, but no one has ever been convicted of anything and no body has ever been found so there remains no closure or solid story of what happened to Jimmy Hoffa to this day. Brandon Lawson Brandon Lawson's story has been covered a lot, but I had to conclude his story as it's one of the most chilling and baffling cases I have come across. Brandon was a 26-year-old man from Texas. He lived with Ledessa, his partner of 10 years, and their three children. On the 8th of August 2013, Brandon and Ledessa had been arguing over normal everyday stresses like Brandon starting a new job and one of their children being unwell. At around 11.50pm, Brandon decided to go and stay at his father's house so they could both cool off. He left the house with his keys and wallet and started the journey to Crowley in Texas where his father lived. Ledessa called Brandon to try and change his mind and told him to either just drive around for a while or go to his brother's house which was only five minutes away from their own. She then called Brandon's brother as she was worried about him, so he and his girlfriend Audrey go to Ledessa's house to check on her. Ledessa then misses several calls from Brandon, who eventually calls his brother at 12.38am and says he has run out of gas on the highway. Kyle arranges to pick up a gas can from Ledessa and then go and meet Brandon so they can go and get gas for Brandon's car. At 12.54am, Brandon then calls 911. He's clearly distressed and urgently wants help. The problem is, the call does not fully make sense and people have been speculating ever since as to what he is saying or what happened to him. Some people even think part of the phone call has been cut out. He has not been seen or heard from since and no trace of him has ever been found. His car was found by police on the side of the highway and his keys and wallet were gone. His brother searched for Brandon all through the night after seeing his abandoned car but could find no trace of him. Here is the original 911 call. 911 emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the not tell Brandon's family about this call and it only came to light after Brandon's phone records were checked by his family and they demanded to hear the call. It seems clear to me that Brandon stumbled across something he shouldn't have that night and that other people were involved. When it sounds like Brandon says they shot the first guy, you can hear what sounds like gunfire in the background. I also find it really odd how he all of a sudden just stops talking to the 911 operator and why didn't she ask him for his name or location? 
We have tried to clean up and slow down the audio to see if it makes anything any clearer. What do you think he's saying and can you hear the gunshots? Brandon did call his brother after the 911 call, and although the signal was very poor, he definitely heard him say he was bleeding and needed help. His family tried calling Brandon again and again, but his phone would go straight to voicemail after this. If Brandon did stumble across some criminal activity, then where is the evidence of the crime and where is Brandon's body? Nothing has ever been found despite extensive searches of all surrounding areas. Brandon's partner, Ledessa, has set up a Facebook page called Help Find Brandon Lawson if you would like to know of any later developments in this case. As always, thanks for watching and see you in the next Mystery Sphere video.